and thank you for joining 60 Hour Shakespeare's third live interview, part of our education series. Charitable giving is core to our cause and we're delighted to be supporting our fundraising efforts for Daisy's Dream, a wonderful local charity that helps children and their families through bereavement and illness. Well, I'm delighted to say that we've actually now hit our 1,000 pound target any additional donations will be greatly appreciated and you can donate um, in your link in the link below. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce and personally thank Professor Emma Smith for joining us this evening. Professor Smith is a tutorial fellow in English and a fellow librarian, professor of Shakespeare studies at the University of Oxford. Her research combines a range of approaches to Shakespeare and early modern drama. Her recent work has been about the reception of Shakespeare and about the scholarly and cultural investments in Shakespearean criticism. This is Shakespeare, um, How to Read the World's Greatest Playwright is her latest publication and one that I'm sure we're all broadly familiar with. It's my huge, huge pleasure to welcome her this evening. Just as some general housekeeping, uh, we will be having a live Q&A at the end. So please pop your questions into the, the conversation box on the side and we'll get to them at the end. Um, but Emma, how are you doing this evening? Where are you joining us from? Really good. Uh, so I'm at home in Oxford uh, and it's uh, it's great to be great to be here with you and really uh, great to be supporting your charity. I think it's doing great work. Oh, well, thank you so much for joining us. Now, I know obviously that you're so well established within the Shakespeare field right now, but I would love to know just how you were first introduced Shakespeare. Was it sort of love at first um, read or? No, it was not love at first read for me. Um, I have been thinking a lot over recent years about Mr. Taylor, who made us read Twelfth Night round the class. I don't think we ever got to the end. I certainly don't remember the end, but I remember the beginning because it was so painful and so laborious and we didn't think any of it was funny and sometimes he would stop and say this is why this is funny or this is why you've mispronounced this we must have been about 12 I suppose it was in my middle middle school um and I felt like that uh, I think there is lots of brilliant Shakespeare teaching in schools now actually my teaching was quite old-fashioned and uh, I suppose reading around the classroom was was meant to be a way of bringing the play alive but it didn't work at all and sometimes I think we do introduce Shakespeare to children too young and it it, it actually um, switches them off rather than switches them on so it wasn't really until I went to university um, that I got interested in in Shakespeare and I also became more interested in Shakespeare as I realized that this was an author and a, and a body of work that was still alive, still changing through performance and through other kinds of appropriation. And that you could have conversations about outside the academy. Uh, the, there were theater goers and theater makers and keen readers and people actually all over the world who had a sense of what Shakespeare meant to them. And that seemed such a, it seemed such a privilege to be part of that conversation. So that's what really got me into, into it, I think. Absolutely. I just, I think I remember from your introduction to This is Shakespeare, you said, you know, this book is a daily to sort of prompt conversations around the pub or, you know, it's about sort of uh, discussing it and, and keeping Shakespeare alive and not just having one sort of set interpretation of it. Yeah. Um, but I know that you have a background in history and I'd be quite curious to know how that affects your kind of understanding or, or way of approaching Shakespeare. Um, so uh, I don't have any uh, formal background in history, but I have um, I had a, a sort of academic training, which is very uh, interested in literature in it, in its historical context. That's a very, um, that's a very Oxford uh, version of English literature. And I suppose I began uh, and still do work sometimes very much thinking about Shakespeare as a, a writer in his, in, in his own day. Um, and I, but I suppose that the histories that I've become more interested in have been the post-Shakespearean ones and why it is uh, Shakespeare can speak to us uh, to, at particular moments in particular ways. So we've, we, we've been through or we are in a moment right now where Sh Shakespeare has come to the fore um, as we've been thinking, how do we deal with plague? How do we deal with lockdown? You know, about this time last year, there was a, a, a viral tweet, if, if we're still able to say that, about um, uh, Shakespeare wrote King Lear during lockdown. And that whole sense about Shakespeare and the plague 
uh, has been very 2020, 2021. Um, and that's a, it's really interesting to live through that moment, um, which echoes how Shakespeare was used when, I don't know, Charles II was restored to the throne or in the Second World War or other kind of uh, historical moments, which um, you can look back on. It's, it's great to live through one. Well, not great, but sort of. Definitely, definitely. And I think some of some of the audience will probably be familiar with your podcast, Approaching Shakespeare, and I'd love to know just how that came about. Yeah, so in some ways, it's, it, it, it dignifies these um, uh, recordings to say that they're podcasts, they're live lecture recordings from my undergraduate lectures in my in my day job in, in my Oxford job, which I did first uh, as an experiment. Um, iTunes University, as it was then, was uh, beginning um, to sort of understand how you could do these kinds of recordings. And not many academics actually wanted to sign up. Um, but I was quite interested in signing up, partly because I thought it would help my own students have better access uh, to the material. And I didn't really particularly think that anyone else would be able to find them or would be interested in them. And there have been... Um, sort of super successful in a, in a really surprising way and in a way that sometimes is a little bit um, uh, a, a little bit terrifying if I think about it too, too, too much. And certainly as I was giving the later, so I, I sort of added to the series over several years uh, and more or less there's a, there's a lecture on each, each play. There, there are some missing and I haven't sort of ever done the final series. Um, I, I got more, in some ways got more and more nervous about the idea that people were listening to these um, uh, sort of outside the lecture, lecture room. So it was a really interesting experience, but they're the lectures which um, in a ad quite heavily adapted form are the part of This Is Shakespeare, the book that you mentioned uh, at the start. Absolutely, now I, I speak as if everyone is familiar and some might not be, but um, your approach to This Is Shakespeare is so fresh and, and for those that have read it, really quite entertaining and exciting. How would you describe how that approach kind of came about? I suppose, um, I suppose I, I didn't want to write, uh, I suppose, there, yeah, so let, let me go back and try and be a bit more articulate. Um, I think I didn't want to write a book that told people the answer to Shakespeare. I think people are, many people are, nervous that they don't understand it or that it's too hard for them or that there are very clever people who can who can explain why, why things certain things are important or how, what what they mean and there are some brilliant books like that um which i which i really enjoy and admire but they're all a little bit about the cleverness of the writer uh, rather than the cleverness of the readers and i wanted to write a book which was more about how clever and able readers are and how they bring their own stuff to Shakespeare and that that's what Shakespeare needs. Um, so you don't need an expert interpreter to, to, to enjoy Shakespeare. I think you need a, a sort of open-minded sense of how this can speak to you. And that's what I've tried to major on uh, in, in the book. Absolutely. And in terms of, I mean, obviously in within the book, you talk about a lot of misconceptions um, about Shakespeare's plays, but what do you think the biggest one is? Um, do you know, I think there are lots of things that we say about Shakespeare. They're not particularly important things, um, but they get repeated uh, over and over again. One of the things, I don't really like the idea that iambic pentameter, which is the rhythm, in which Shakespeare wrote some of his lines, but not all of them. I'm not particularly interested in iambic pentameter anyway. I think, what, what do you know when you know it? But one of the things I really don't like about it is the idea that because iambic means unstressed stress, so it's da-dum, 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 that it's, that it's like a heartbeat and that this is somehow uh, a kind of visceral language of, of the body because I think, what about all the other languages that aren't iambic? Are, are they sort of disembodied in some way? I feel I feel as if that's a cliche that doesn't it isn't isn't really very um, isn't very helpful. Although sometimes I've heard actors uh, talk about how how they use it to harness kind of physical energy, which I guess I guess is is, is interesting. But yeah, there are lots of things people say about Shakespeare um, that I think are 
either not really true or just actually a bit boring. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, the, the approach to the way that you've, you've written it, I made it more accessible. And, you know, the fact that you don't have to necessarily like every production, you don't have to respect every production. Ha has there been an adaption that you've particularly loved um, any sort of Shakespeare adaption, whether that's in, in stage, on, on film? Um, I have got pretty, um, uh, pretty broad tastes, actually. I like, uh, I like seeing what people do with Shakespeare, and I particularly like it if I thought, if I think, well, I would never have done that, or I can't imagine, uh, I would never have imagined that, even if I don't really... Kind of enjoy it I feel uh, it, it's enlivening and it's challenging in some way it's sometimes really good to see a production that you don't like just as it's good to see a film adaptation of a novel that you love and and to understand why you know if you don't like it what does that tell you about your assumptions and your your kind of reading of reading of the novel so I would I mean I'd put on my list um, anything from um, say the films of Orson Welles, the Shakespeare films of Orson Welles, which I, which I absolutely love. Uh, Othello is a, is a film that I've uh, written lots about and, and come back to over and over again in my career. Uh, so Two Chimes at Midnight, his uh, amazing um, series around the Henry the fourth place, focusing on Falstaff, focusing on uh, Orson Welles himself as Falstaff. So I'd go from that at the sublime end or at the ridiculous end, however you want to see it, through to something like, um, Gnomeo and Juliet, I like that very much, which is a garden gnome version of uh, of the great tragedy, if you don't know it. A very clever, uh, very wry, a sort of Lego movie take on, on, on Shakespeare. Really, you know, really enjoyable, really, really fun. Um, but I've also seen, I've seen productions, stage productions, which have completely changed my views of how a play might um, uh, how play might work or what, what it might what it might do a wonderful um, all's well that ends well which is a tricky play that um, I don't think um, we've ever quite sort of got to grips with a wonderful sort of fairy tale uh, version of that at the National Theatre so yeah I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty omnivorous about those things. Definitely. And it's quite interesting because we've had a few interviews where we've interviewed producers and directors and you're, you're our first academic, which we feel very, very lucky to, to have. Oh, that's great. Um, Me too. I feel very lucky. Yeah. Um, but I'd be quite interested, like, you know, you know, approaching Shakespeare, as we say, you know, you can approach it as a producer or a director. But, you know, what would your advice be to, you know, someone looking to stage a production, but, but with your kind of, I guess, an academic or approaching Shakespeare hat on? Cut. Cut. <laughs> yeah, cut. Uh, I think for most audiences and for most companies and for most interpretations, Shakespeare's too long. Uh, and, and that feels as if it's a heresy, but I, I don't think it is at all. I think, I think sensitive cutting, you can often cut, you can often scoop out the middle of speeches and keep the beginning and the end because that's where Shakespeare tends to tell you what he's going to say and then tell you what he said. And the middle bit, you can sometimes cut quite quite effectively. Uh, so yeah, that would be my uh, you know that's that's not what people expect me to say, and they expect me to be um, about how uh, every word of Shakespeare is is kind of wonderful and meaningful and poetic. And there are certainly readings you can do like that, but they're quite hard to do in the moment in the theatre. So how I would advise people to produce uh, to, or direct Shakespeare is to have a sense what you think it means and tell us, um, and don't be frightened of that, And but definitely cut. Definitely, definitely. And I'd be curious to know as well, because I know that you've done some work with the National Theatre and the Royal Shakespeare Company. I mean, can you tell us a little bit more about how, how you've worked or collaborated with theatre companies in the past? Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've learned a lot from, do from doing this. I'm, mostly I've done some version of um, either being in the rehearsal room at an early read through where I am a sort of um, Elizabethan dictionary or a kind of what does this mean or what's going on here or why is this important. Uh, sometimes I've been um, given a kind of introduction to the play and the themes and then taken questions from actors and directors. Sometimes I've worked with directors um, on their own who are thinking about 
um, plays and suggested things that they might read or suggested ways they might uh, they might approach it. Um, and sometimes I've had a bit more um, a, a little bit more about to do with um, abridgments and and kind of th thinking about thinking about the text. So I, I mean. I, I've learned, it's an amazing privilege to work with, with actors and directors um, because their questions about the plays are, really tend to be pretty different from, the, from my students and from me. I'm not, I'm not an actor or a director myself um, and nor do I particularly want to be. I mean, I've got the best of it, best of it by having the chance to work, uh, to work uh, sometimes with, with these groups. Absolutely, and that was actually going to be one of my questions: was whether you ever ever thought you'd dip dip your sort of toe in acting or directing? But we we know no, that. No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, for the same reason that I don't think uh, I would ever really want to write poetry or write a novel. I mean, I think that there are people who would be much better at it than me. Um, and uh, you know, the great thing is to appreciate them uh, for that. Absolutely. And given, obviously, you've got such a broad um, career, having, you know, worked as a professor, an author, almost a consultant, is there one area that you, you really love or, or that you love more? Yeah, I, yeah, I love, uh, I love the variety that I am able to have in my, in my work. And that's, a, uh, I feel very, very lucky to have that. So I have amazing students. I love teaching. Uh, I love the work that we do with students. Um, I uh, enjoy the, um, you know, thinking and researching and being part of a, a, a very sort of vibrant academic community here. I love the uh, libraries and the resources that we have. And I also really enjoy being able to, uh, try, trying to develop my abilities actually to communicate this work to a wider audience. So one of the things I'm doing at the moment is um, I'm really prepping Ken Dodd, um, uh, a brilliant comedian of the 1950s to the 1990s and, and beyond, um, for a documentary which is about Ken Dodd and his theories of humour, uh, part of which is going to have a strand about sort of Shakespeare and, and uh, Will Kemp, uh, his great comic actor. And I just think... Um, as, as sort of preparing for that, doing some of the prep for that yesterday. And I was thinking, God, this is I'm really lucky. What, what an amazing, what an amazing job to have. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I like the bits. I like the variety of stuff that I, that I get the chance to do. Absolutely. Is there anyone that you would like to collaborate on and collaborate with in the future or you're waiting for a call from? Yeah, I'd, I, I'd love to collaborate. I think there's some really... Um, there's some amazing work, Shakespeare production work uh, in in European theatres, uh, in Amsterdam, uh, in Berlin. Uh, I, I I think it's been not being able to go anywhere that's made me much more conscious um, of how important it is to do that. And I really hope uh, to do a bit of that. I did a Zoom conversation with the director, Robert Icke, who I really admire uh, and I hope there might be some chance to collaborate with him at some at some point. Absolutely. And in terms of, I mean, you mentioned obviously being a teacher. I'd be so curious to know as a teacher over lockdown, how has that changed for you? Has it been quite challenging to kind of um, and make that transformation? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's been challenging for everyone, hasn't it? And in some ways, the um, uh, maybe this this last period uh, has been the most difficult of all. I think lots of people have found that in lots of areas of life. I think last year there was a, a sort of emergency feeling to it, and, and that gives a kind of adrenaline. And uh, people were very inventive about using these formats, uh, and and there was a, a sort of air of slightly hysterical fun about it. And I think this last few months has been more of a grind. We've run out, all run out of energy uh, and um, uh, sort of enjoyment of this. So I think the students, um, students have done amazingly to, to get, through, get through this year. In certain ways, there are aspects of teaching online which are, um, which are fine and in some ways better. I mean, we, uh, we, we've been recording lectures for students to listen to whenever they want to. 
they've been agitating to do that for years. And we've always said, no, it's important that you come and hear them in real time and a part of a, a kind of moment. Um, I, I was always skeptical about that. And I don't think it's turned out to be true. I think people can listen to lectures on the, you know, on their own. Um, and that, that, you know, that's, that's been a, in some ways a good thing, but we've all missed the lots of, uh, lots of literature study I think is about interpersonal trust and communication. And the thing I most miss about it, about in-person teaching is um, in some ways the, the sort of slight wasted time when you just, you just chat or someone comes in and they're out of breath because they've come from something else and they tell you what that something else was. And there's a flattening effect, isn't there, about, about Zoom, however much energy you try and put into the, into the room, there's a, everybody's a bit two dimensional. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been an interesting pivot, but I'm really very very much looking forward, and hoping fingers crossed that next year is uh, is is more like more like normal. Definitely, I know we're all dying to get back into the sort of theatre and um, obviously lecture hall in some instances. Yeah. Is there anything that you you know any uh, theatre that you're looking forward to kind of going back and um, enjoying Shakespeare. Yeah, all, all of them actually. Um, all of them in their different ways. I've been thinking about thinking about that and thinking about um, uh, some of the London theatres I really enjoy and the big studio um, uh, sort of black box kind of theatres, thinking about Stratford, thinking about my local theatres, the North Wall, uh, the fire station. Um, you know, it seems a long time since I, uh, since, since I was at any of them. So yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. And the cinema. Um, uh, I have not had very good use from my Curzon membership, but uh, maybe, maybe that will come. Fingers crossed, definitely. Um, and obviously, I think over lockdown, obviously, has probably given everyone a lot of time to think. I'd be so curious to know, obviously, you wrote um, Approaching Shakespeare, just a, sorry, this is Shakespeare, just um, a few years ago. Is there anything that now going back you would want to approach again? Or would there ever be a sequel to this book? Um, I don't think there would be a sequel, um, although this is more Shakespeare would be, uh, it's, yeah. quite, it's, it's quite compelling. No, I, I, I write about 20 plays. And so in theory, there could be another book about 20 plays. Um, it would be a bit of a B list, although not all B list. Uh, lots of people have told me off for not including uh, As You Like It, not including Henry V, uh, various other favorites that people have that I haven't, haven't got in there. Um, so po possibly, uh, I don't know, nobody's come clamoring to ask me, ask me to do it. Well, if I would do it differently, I'm sure I would. And I hope, I hope I would, because I hope, um, I hope my sense of what's possible in Shakespeare's plays and from Shakespeare's plays is changing and that I am not, because, because what I'm trying to uh, talk about is the openness and what, what I call in the book, the gappiness of Shakespeare's plays. I hope that hasn't hardened into a kind of itself, a weird kind of orthodoxy where I can't, you know, I've, I've got the things I say about these plays and I haven't got anything else to say. Um, and I think seeing, seeing new adaptations, reading new things, rereading the works um, all, always, brings, always brings new, new things. And if I, I mean, if I, if I was a right now, I would write about Measure for Measure as a plague play, I think, which I didn't think of at the time and I had never thought of before. Absolutely. And, and very timely and relevant now. Um, is there a particular writer, I mean, other than Shakespeare, obviously, that's had a sort of influence on your, your writing and your kind of academic career? So I have um, focused pretty much on Shakespeare for the last decade or so. I'm interested in lots of his contemporaries, um, uh, in, in, in Marlowe particularly, and, and Webster and Johnson for the stage, in Thomas Nash, great prose writer and satirist whose work I'm editing uh, at the moment as part of a big project. Um, I think what's great about these writers is they draw you into their world What's great about Shakespeare is the ease with which we have drawn him into ours. And I think that that does make a difference. Uh, it's not so easy uh, to think about some of these other writers, except in a more historical uh, context, which, which I also, which I do also enjoy. Um, but yeah, I, I, um, 
I, I teach quite quite a wide canon beyond Shakespeare, um, and uh, I read a lot of stuff, contemporary stuff, um, as well as as well as historical. Absolutely, and I think obviously, obviously, we've got a lot of actors and probably aspiring um, uh, students that want to go into greater detail. I mean, are there? You sort of mentioned there's obviously quite a varied contemporaries that you might want to look into. Is there any sort of advice for them kind of going into a, a, a career or a livelihood involving Shakespeare? Well, that's a great question. Um, I think, yeah, I think don't be frightened of it. I think that's what I would say that, that Shakespeare, um, there are some fantastic roles there. Uh, and some fantastic directors to work with. So just, yeah, don't be frightened of it. Absolutely. And, do, and do you have a favorite Shakespeare play? I imagine you probably get this a lot. Yeah, I don't really. Um, sometimes when I'm asked that question, I say Macbeth. Um, I think I partly say it to annoy people who think you shouldn't say Macbeth and you should say the Scottish play or something. Yeah. Um, I do, I do, uh, I do find Macbeth a hugely intensely powerful play uh, and uh, a very sort of morally equivocal and uh, terrifying one. Uh, and so I think, yeah, that, that is one of my favourites. But I tend to feel whatever I'm working on, I am finding interesting and can sort of find new things to talk about. So I've just written a short thing for a magazine for, for, for school students about Othello. I've been trying to think about how it might be possible to think about this play, both as a feminist and an anti-racist and how the end of the play sort of pits one against the other. You're, you're, you're either focusing on what's happened to Desdemona or you're, you're focusing on what's happened to Othello and how we might be able to sort of bring those bring those together. And I found it really interesting to go back to that play. Definitely. I think even as you say, just going back to, you know, measure for measure and looking at it as a, as a play play, I think it's, it's never complete. Yeah. Um, with that, I mean, again, you've done so, such very, so, so much varied work is what I'm trying to say and made, made it so available which has been a real kind of I think godsend to people that have listened to your podcast read your book you know do you think there's more work to be done to make Shakespeare more accessible to to audiences that may not have you know again may not have taken to it at school or you know may not have been exposed in the same way that other people have been I do um I, I suppose my slight hesitation is and this is a odd thing for me to say, I suppose. I sometimes think we overvalue Shakespeare and we suggest that somehow, you know, uh, liking or understanding Shakespeare is the key to sort of personal success or uh, social mobility or something. That's, and that's clearly, that clearly over, uh, sort, of, sort of overstates Shakespeare's uh, importance and reinforces certain kinds of hierarchies, which I think are not very helpful. But I do think this is a, this is a big conversation, uh, what Shakespeare means, uh, how his plays work. It's a conversation that ranges across cultures and languages and across history, and it, and it ranges across forms. Uh, so it ranges across cinema and uh, anime or manga and opera and musical and rap and all, all kinds of things. So it, it's it's a, a very um, expansive conversation that if you can be part of, you can you can almost certainly find the bit that interests you. And that's not that's not necessarily the case with all the things that you might um, you know you, you might want to learn more about. So yeah, I hope um, I, so, I say in the book that it's. Uh, although I'm really delighted that lots of I've been lots of people have been in touch with me who who have been reading it as part of their A level or or college studies. Um, but I do say actually this is for people who don't need to take an exam. You know, e exams re require you to say this is what this means, and this is a book which is saying. Uh, something something a bit different and so people who are willing uh, to have a pop at that that would that would be great absolutely great and and lots of people because they're chapters on individual plays and and so too the podcasts are on individual plays 
lots of people have just read those plays, uh, you know, read about those plays before going to the theatre or before, you know, going to do something, uh, encounter those newly. Uh, that, that seems a useful, useful thing to offer. Absolutely. I think we were just saying before we started the call this morning, uh, sorry, this, this, this evening that I was, I used to listen to your podcast going to our Shakespeare readings and it was a great kind of conversation starter when I arrived. So it's, it's definitely done that. You mentioned briefly, obviously, about, uh, you know, sort of transcending the globe and, you know, you have different people in different communities and different approaches, you know, depending on where you are. Have you had any kind of interesting fans message you from outside the UK or... Yeah, uh, for a while we used to get the podcast, the download statistics um, broken down by, by geography, and there were that was really really interesting. You know, there are and there are lots of uh, universities um, in particular that use these uh, podcasts and have used them, especially during lockdown. But universities in in non English speaking countries, um, uh, there was quite a lot of interest from Tehran, which was which was amazing. Um, uh, and from Russia, uh, lots across the rest of uh, uh, across Europe, uh, I hear a lot from people in the in, in the US. Um, so yeah, it's been. I mean, that's been an amazing, um, uh, unexpected aspect of this, and attests really to Shakespeare as a as a global, a kind of global phenomenon now. Definitely. Well, I think even just testimony to the people that we have watching the stream tonight, I don't think we would have ever been able to kind of bring in such an international audience pre-COVID. So it's been a wonderful outcome mm. to really be able to connect across the globe. Um, I would love to know just, um, I mean, this is kind of a big question, but um, if you could speak to Shakespeare and kind of have a 10 minute audience with him, you know, is there anything you'd like to ask him or you'd be quite curious to, to find out? You know, I think if we met Shakespeare, we would all be deeply disappointed. I don't think he would be delivering. I mean, it's really hard to separate out the, the Shakespeare that's, that's sort of so revered and so on a pedestal with a kind of ordinary, balding, um, uh, probably rather smelly, uh, sort of Elizabethan man with the attitudes and you know worldview of his uh, of his of his own period. So I kind of think uh, it would be it it would be a, a really a really really terrible disappointment. Uh, there's a great DC comic where Superman goes back in time uh, and meets Shakespeare and uh, dis discovers that Shakespeare actually needs a little bit of help with his. Uh, playwriting and so uh, he Superman pens a few um, big speeches uh, for him and it's it's quite an interesting take on the idea that that, that we've got lots of versions of that haven't we that uh, a Shakespeare who's a more human a more human figure like uh, as Joseph Fiennes plays him in in Shakespeare in in love I guess if I if I were having that conversation I might ask him um do you know, I might ask him if he liked dogs. <laughs> and that's because um, there was a very uh, s s famous book about Shakespeare in the 1930s called Shakespeare's Imagery and What It Tells Us. And Caroline Spurgeon, who wrote that, documented all the imagery that Shakespeare used. And she categorised it. And then she said, we can deduce back from this what Shakespeare himself thought. And it's such an interesting, I think it's a bonkers premise, actually, but it's such an interesting premise. And one of the things she says is Shakespeare did not like dogs. Whenever he has an image of a dog, it's a negative one and it leads to a sort of whole lot of negative things. So I might, I feel as if that's a, a fairly robust question, not too artifarty and not too abstract, that Shakespeare would probably be able to answer. And that would be really interesting about the the kind of the extent to which we can deduce back from Shakespeare's plays anything about him himself. I'm I'm skeptical about that, but it will be interesting to know. No, that, that I think I, we would never have thought about that until until right now. I'd be <laughs> just on the back of that because that's quite again quite a thought provoking question. You must teach obviously you've teached hundreds of students. Has there ever been one question that they've asked you that has really left you? 
sort of stumped or surprised? Um, yeah, I mean, lots, lots and lots of, uh, lots and lots of questions about, um, you know, things I just, I just don't know or things I don't think are known. Um, in some ways, I think the million dollar question about Shakespeare is how did, how did he um, sort of catapult himself from this relatively small scale impact uh, in a small country, in a small language um, at, at the end of the 16th and into the 17th century? How, how did we get from then to, to now? How did we get this sort of brand Shakespeare? Um, and that's a really difficult question to answer because there is an element of the of the answer which is qualitative. It's saying Shakespeare is really good, whatever that means and however we define that. And uh, But some of it is more contingent. It's about being in the right place at the right time or being in print in particular forms. So one of the... One of the areas of my academic work has been in the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays, which we call the first folio. And one of my arguments about that is because it's such a big book, it's actually very difficult to lose. Um, it, it's easily on hand when at the restoration and the reopening of the theatres in 1660, the suddenly an absolute panic about what's going to be the first play to be put on, how, how we're going to get the theatre up and running like by Friday or something. And there is something available about Shakespeare's plays there on the shelf uh, that, that, that is as much to do with their material form as it is to do with their intrinsic qualities. Uh, that, that means that they're there and they don't get lost like most of the other playwrights of his, of his period um, get forgotten about. Definitely. I'm going to have to think back. I'm thinking of my massive anthology that I have that's quite quite difficult to lose, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think I know that we're running short on time, so I'm just going to ask people to put their questions into the chat box and, and we will get through to them because there's quite a few already. Um, I mean, one thing that I know that you, you may not have seen one of our 60 hour Shakespeare productions, but one of the things that we do quite differently is we rehearse it in a very intensive period, which we believe is quite similar to the rehearsal practices of the time. I wondered if you had any sort of comment on that or. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really interesting um, uh, way, a really interesting way to work. It's absolutely clear that Shakespeare's company had um, probably, you know, four or five or six plays in the repertoire at any at any one time with relatively few performances of each one and that therefore their rehearsal time was quite limited. One of the clever things about, about um, some plays of this period um, and, and some, some plays by Shakespeare is they seem to be written to allow for um, separate or dispersed rehearsals. That's to say, some, some characters really only interact with one or two other characters until the very end of the play. And that means you can do smaller rehearsals. That's probably in part a practical consideration about how you rehearse um, and uh, you know, how you get to put the, play, put the play together. So I think that's, I think that's a really um, great one. And I haven't seen one of the productions, but I'm really, really keen to. Definitely. I think that's, it, it does add a sort of energy and dyna, um, dynamism that, Basically, if you you know if you are kind of rehearsing, you've got that energy, and I think it goes back to your point about cutting and kind of don't overthink it. You know, don't yep. overthink the, the production. Um, there is some rumours on the street that we may be um, approaching Othello next, um, and I know you mentioned again that you've done quite a lot of research on it. I wondered if you had any advice to us um, heading into this production. <laughs> Well, it's a brilliantly, uh, brilliantly topical play. I think um, uh, there was a, uh, a a great scholarly book that I often um, refer to by a man called Reg Folks, which was called Hamlet versus Lear, which made it sound like it was you know Godzilla versus you know some big sort of slugging out of the tragic characters. But what what Folks argues is that Hamlet is the tragedy for the 19th century, and it's the play in which the 19th century sees its own intellectual melancholic doubts reflected back at it. And then he says, 
King Lear is the tragedy for the 20th century because there we see our monstrous inhumanity and cruelty to each other and the sort of, you know, uh, genocides and nuclear weapons and all that back, back at us. Um, and, and folks leaves it at the end of the 20th century. And I think for the 21st century, Othello is, is, is gonna be the play and it's a play about uh, religious clashes, clashes of ideology, uh, what it's like to be a person who has a split or a composite identity, an identity which is um, uh, the identity of the migrant or the refugee or uh, somebody who is uh, not, not in a community of their own um, ethnic or, or sort of communal type. Um, and how how that how that works how that feels uh, what it's, what what Venice as a city um, made up of people from all kinds of places how that works how that operates what are the places of inclusion what are the places of exclusion um, so I think I think it's really an amazingly topical play we talk a lot in my classes now about about Cyprus you know so Cyprus is the island that. Um, Othello and Desdemona uh, go to and it looks in the play as if it's going to be a version of the the kind of green world that we're so used to in Shakespeare like the Forest of Arden or something it's where where people go to get away from trouble and they they're in a, a new less urban place and there are new possibilities and in fact Othello frustrates that um, expectation because Cyprus maybe the uh, island of Aphrodite, the goddess of love, but it's also a military, a military island, just as it is now, uh, an island. I mean, modern Cyprus is split um, uh, between uh, Turkish and, and Greek uh, um, Cypresses. Uh, and it's, you know, the Gr Greek Cyprus is the place where American planes refuel uh, or are stationed, you know, for <clears throat> Middle Eastern forays and stuff. I mean, it still is part of, you know, it's not an escape from those tensions. It's it's actually the crucible of them. So, I, I mean, I'm so uh, fascinated by you you doing that play. I think it's I think it's got so much to tell us um, in some quite disturbing ways now. Absolutely, and I think it yeah it goes to the point of you know asking those questions as an actor and you know, it, it's an exploration. It's not just about performing it, it's about asking provoking questions and a, a student can as much be an actor in performing it as an actor can be a student in kind of um, performing it as well. So, so um, no, that, I think that's a wonderful poignant end to kind of open the, open the floor to questions and we've got quite a few. So Angie um, asked, I think it's going back to your point about cutting. Do you think that Shakespeare would have cut his plays down if he was directing them today? Uh, I do think he would have cut them down. And we've got some evidence um, that uh, cutting happened uh, during, you know, to the plays during Shakespeare's lifetime and, and probably done by him. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think Shakespeare was a pragmatic writer who understood that he was writing for the theatre. I don't think he's a frustrated, so some versions of Shakespeare see, seem to see him as a sort of frustrated poet who uh, is a bit um, disappointed that he has to cheapen himself working for the theatre, but that's not true. Shakespeare had early success as a poet. He could have carried on as a poet if he'd wanted to, but he didn't. Uh, he went He went to the theatre and that was the medium he wanted. So I think that sense of the, that the script it's so liberating to think about Shakespeare's plays as scripts because scripts are always mobile and they're always being changed in accordance with what's available in the performance uh, and what's needed in the performance. So yeah, Angie, I think, I think he would. Absolutely. And also on the matter of um, cutting, we've got a question from Olga from Russia who is currently cutting a production of Julius Caesar. And she's finding it a little bit more difficult than other plays because of those wonderful long speeches. Do you have any advice to her kind of embarking on this mission? Hi, Olga. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things I learned, I just mentioned it, but maybe I'll just say it again. What I, I learned from looking at um, the script of Romeo and Juliet that's behind Baz Luhrmann's film, the film with Leonardo DiCaprio and um, Claire Danes, is that... Um, cutting, keeping the beginning and the end of speeches and taking the middle out um, can actually uh, move the play along a little bit more quickly, but keep keep the shape 
uh, of of the uh, of the thoughts, and it can sometimes highlight more effectively then some some a long speech that you might want to keep, like um, uh, Brutus's uh, speech about uh, as he is sort of talking through the the inevitability to him of the of the assassination of Caesar. If you keep that pretty much intact, it has a different it falls differently in the play if, if some of the rest of the play around it uh, works a bit more quickly. Absolutely, I think that's some good advice. Um, Henry from California found that performing in full length uh, Zoom productions of Shakespeare, he's discovered such a rich emotional uh, raison d'etre of the characters in the pass passengers, sorry, passages usually cut because they don't drive the story forward. Have you noticed that yourself? Um, I have not seen a full uncut Zoom uh, performance, in fact, and I have not been the most attentive consumer of Zoom theatre. Um, I've found, shamefully, I've, I've, I've done some things, but I found shamefully that the, it, often the last thing I've wanted to do in the evenings is to be on Zoom again. Um, uh, and I've wanted to, I've, I've read a lot more uh, physical books and um, you know, listen to music. In fact, rather than going to those things. But I'm glad. I'm glad Henry's found that. I certainly think that reading. I don't think that Shakespeare is. Uh, I didn't mean to suggest that I think Shakespeare's uh, sort of verbiage, or that there's no value in his language. I, I, I completely. That's not what I think at all. I think there are pleasures in reading Shakespeare that are not always the same pleasures as seeing Shakespeare performed. But it sounds like you've had an experience where where that was more. Um, uh, more aligned. Absolutely. And I think um, Nettie is, has, has just made a comment to say that she had the pleasure of taking Oxford's continuing education course and really enjoyed uh, the Cambridge introduction to Shakespeare. Um, how might an actor use strategic, uh, sorry, a strategic capacity to develop their character arc when it's not written on the page or seem, it seems to be a plot device? Okay, so uh, Nettie's talking about a phrase that I've borrowed from the brilliant Shakespeare critic Stephen Greenblatt. And Greenblatt looks uh, at, uh, in, in his uh, sort of biography of Shakespeare, which is called Will in the World, he looks at how Shakespeare uh, tends to use his source material. And what um, Greenblatt uh, notices is that what Shakespeare tends to strip out motivations that were very clear in the sources and he makes them opaque uh, and he makes them opaque for his own purposes, hence strategic opacity. So that means that, for example, in the sources for Othello, the Iago character is explained immediately as saying he is in love with Desdemona. That's why he, that's why he does what he does, because he's in love with Desdemona. Now, of course, why Iago behaves as he does has been one of the great sort of critical questions about that play and a great sort of question of character criticism uh, for 200 years. Um, I think Greenblatt's observation suggests that Shakespeare wants us to ask that question because he has taken out an easy answer and instead left all these kind of possibilities. So I think that latency or, or that... Um, uh, unspokenness is an is an enormous resource uh, uh, for for an actor uh, who can draw on that in their um, in their understanding of the lines that are spoken or in their uh, sort of inhabiting uh, of of the of of the character. Um, and often actors and directors have quite clear understandings of. Uh, what the, what they think the motivation is, you know. So it's it's not actually opaque; it's just uns, unspoken. Definitely, I hope it's difficult when you can't actually have the people there because they're saying. I hope that answered your question, um, Nettie, in the audience. Um, There's also a great uh, question from Paul, also from the US. Uh, what are your thoughts, if any, on original pronunciation of uh, in performances performances of Shakespeare? Well, uh, Paul, I think it's very um, interesting. It's interesting that most original pronunciation puts Shakespearean English somewhere between sort of Birmingham and Virginia. Uh, and that's that tells us some really interesting things about the English language and how it's changed and how American English relates perhaps to early modern English in ways 
uh, different uh, from the way modern uh, UK English does. So I think they're certainly interesting and I think they're academically interesting. I have never seen, I've only seen uh, one production and one read through in original pronunciation. And each time I found it profoundly alienating um, and uh, disappointing as theater. I think anything which makes us, uh, um, uh, makes it hard to get through to Shakespeare's words. Um, I mean, Shakespeare's words are hard enough actually, aren't they? And they're hard enough without being pronounced in a really weird way. I don't think the gain that we see that, this word sounded more like this word. And so here's a pun that we didn't know. That's a, that, that's a kind of gain, but it's, it's cost for me, it's very high. So yeah, academically interesting, theatrically, not so. I think that ties quite nicely as well into Pedro's question. And Pedro um, is referring to part of your um, answer earlier where you were mentioning iambic pentameter and like focusing on that might be a cliche. I think Pedro's seen a few performances where they flatten the rhythm um, to make it more accessible and lost a bit of the, the quality in his opinion. What, what do you think of, of, of that? Do you think it, it needs to be completely... Uh, I, don't, I think the point that you're making was that it doesn't need to be ignored, but it's just maybe there's more, too much focus on it. So I think the point I was making was, I don't think it's a very interesting uh, thing to talk about. Uh, that's not to say that Shakespeare's lines are not rhythmic, um, but I'm not sure that naming them or still uh, less, you know, making a lot of marks above each syllable about whether they're stressed or unstressed. I don't know that I find that all that really all that all that helpful. I mean, I'm really interested by Pedro's question. What's clear if you watch a film like Laurence Olivier's Hamlet from 1948 is how much verse speaking has changed uh, and has changed over the 50 or 60 or 70 years. We, we have a different sense now of how idiomatic or natural seeming we want Shakespeare to be. And uh, previous generations felt that Shakespearean English and Shakespearean rhythms were to be kept distinct from um, the, the sort of rhythms of ev everyday speech. Um, I, I don't have an absolute view on that, I think, but I think that performances tend to be more successful where actors feel confident that what they're saying, um, A, that they, they feel they understand what they're saying and B, that they are, um, they have a sense of the 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 the, the, the rhythm the, the 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 rhythm of the syllables the rhythm of the of the speech aligns with what's important uh, to to convey about its content. Uh, and I think what, where actors are sort of uncertain about that, and sometimes the flattening out uh, that Pedro is talking about does make actors un uncertain, and it makes, for example, a split line, a line which is half with one character and half with another, quite difficult to sort of keep together and to pace properly. Um, so um, it's very interesting seeing, I mean, a, a classically trained company like the Royal Shakespeare Company have changed quite a lot their voice, uh, their voice work uh, over the last generation or so. And that's, you know, that's an interesting thing to see, you know, how, how, how these things change. Shakespeare doesn't sound to us like it sounded uh, in, the, in 1600, but it doesn't sound like it did in 1960 either. And that actually, again, all these questions are, are somehow magically weaving together. Um, Tom has also asked, how does Shakespeare need to change um, in universities and in theatre? He mentions, again, there's a tendency to sort of typecast comic roles as sort of northern accents and, and bits and pieces. But um, as an academic, what, what do you think the future of Shakespeare should look like? Yeah, that's a great question, Tom. And that's one of my bugbears too. I, um, there are two characters in The Tempest who are the drunken butler and the, and the jester, Trinculo and Stefano, and they're always played as Scottish, uh, with, Scot with bad Scottish accents, that's to say, not as Scottish. They're played with bad Scottish accents. And I think, you know, regional accents uh, are a terrible cliche. Um, the, the, the language of the so-called rude mechanicals, the speech of the rude mechanicals in Midsummer Night's Dream often just makes me wince. So yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I think there are questions about um, Shakespeare's uh, relevance to wider, to, to, to wider audiences, the move away from 
a kind of received pronunciation, but I actually think Shakespeare performances have been in the vanguard of, for example, cross-gender casting, um, uh, the casting of actors of colour in a broader range of roles. Um, Shakespeare, because I suppose because Shakespeare uh, has a, a, a box office presence, let's say, uh, it's been more possible to use these plays to mobilise some more progressive um, ideas about theatre, how theatre needs to change more generally. Um, but I hope we don't, having had this break in theatre tradition, I hope we don't lose momentum on some of the interesting uh, experiments with sort of digital and hybrid theatre. Um, you know, the theatre needs to, Shakespeare, and Shakespeare has always been part of a theatre that's, that's, that's um, adapting uh, and innovating. And I hope that, I hope that does continue. Definitely. And I think on, on the, the back of that, I mean, and you mentioned obviously some of the wonderful adaptations, Romeo and Juliet, some of the productions that you've re really liked. Have you in your research ever sort of thought, why have they not ever put on, you know, Othello in this way? Or why have they not ever staged a production like this? Um, I'm sure I probably have thought that. I'm just trying to think if I can, um, if I can think of an example. Um, I can't exactly, but I love the cartoonist Tom Gold, um, G-A-U-L-D. I don't know if, if you are um, familiar with, with his work. He does a lot of literary kind of cartoons. And one of his cartoons is a sort of um, spin, spinometer, really, which uh, about how to manage your Shakespeare adaptation. So it has, you know, you, it first picks the play and then it picks a setting and then it picks a sort of style and, and something. And it brings these kind of amazingly... Uh, sort of mad uh, juxtapositions uh, together, but sometimes they actually it actually produces combinations where you think, yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine that, I can imagine that. Perfect, and that I think probably ties into the last question that I have, and one that we like to ask all the people that we interview. Um, if you could have a dinner party with three Shakespearean characters, who would they be, and why? Um, I think they would probably be. Um, Beatrice from Much Ado About Nothing because I think she'd be very funny um, I think that's always a good thing at a dinner party um, I think perhaps um, hmm I don't know you know I, fi I find this I have I know you asked me this in advance and I should have prepared it better I can't really think because quite a lot of these characters, I think, are probably. Um, it's always you want you want a really minor character, don't you? Because you want somebody who's going to listen to everybody else. You don't want all these major characters. So maybe we need um, Rosencrantz or Guildenstern or somebody. Maybe they'd be a good foil for some uh, for some wit in wit in other people. Yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, I'm hope, hoping we're not going to be in lockdown, whether it be with Shakespearean characters or any other <laughs> other circumstances and that we're coming out of this. Mm. But um, again, um, Emma, I really just want to thank you again for giving us um, the time this evening. I feel like we've had a real adventure covering lots and lots of different topics. I can't quite believe that it was just one hour. Um, I think, hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Um, I'd like to thank as well everyone who's joined tonight and all, all of the great questions.